Today, we're checking out Intel's new Core Ultra 7 265K, the replacement for the Core i7 14700K. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how those two compare. And of course, how the 265K stacks up against the AMD competition. Now, before we get into the benchmark data, let's quickly go over a few of the basic specifications for the Core Ultra 7 265K. I'm gonna skip a lot of the platform and testing information that was covered in our 285K video. So if you want all those details, please watch that review first. As for the 265K, it features eight P cores with eight threads, as again, hyper-threading is no longer used for the Arrow Lake architecture. The P cores feature a base frequency of 3.9 gigahertz and a boost of 5.5 gigahertz, and that's a mere 2% frequency reduction when compared to the Core i7-14700K. Then there are the E cores, and in total we have 12, again with 12 threads as there is no SMT support. The cores operate at a base frequency of 3.3 gigahertz, but can clock as high as 4.6 gigahertz, which is actually a 7% increase when compared to the E cores featured on the 14700K. In total, there's 30 megabytes of L3 cache and 36 megabytes of L2 cache, and that's seen when combining the L2 cache of the P and E cores. The P cores each receive 3 megabytes of L2 cache, whereas the E cores get 4 megabytes per cluster, and each cluster consists of four cores. Finally, the base TDP is 125 watts with a max turbo set at 250 watts. And for this, Intel is charging $395 US per 1000 units. It's also worth noting that all KSKU models, which are currently the only models that have been announced, support dual channel DDR5-5600 UDIM memory or DDR5-6400 CUDIM memory. And in short, CUDIM memory features a small clock driver circuit directly on the module, and this allows for more precise timings that are required at higher memory speeds. All models provide 20 PCIe 5.0 lanes and four PCIe 4.0 lanes, along with a direct media interface 4.0 eight lane bus to the chipset. As usual, the KSKU parts have an unlocked clock multiplier and therefore can be overclocked. Now for our testing, we have multiple different test systems. So rather than discuss all of the hardware and configurations, you're welcome to pause the video here and study the test system specs. And once you've done that, you can move on to the benchmark graphs. First up, let's take a look at how the 265 behaves under load. And again, for cooling, I'm using the new MSI Mag Core Liquid i360, which was provided in our review kit and is designed and optimized specifically for these new Arrow Lake CPUs. MSI has created a unique bracket that migrates the cold plate north for a three degree reduction in temperature as it better targets the hotspot on these new Arrow Lake CPUs. So with the Core Liquid i360 strapped on, I loaded up the 265K with Cinebench where we saw an average clock frequency of 4.6 gigahertz on the E cores and 5.2 gigahertz on the P cores. And this was achieved while remaining within the stock 250 watt power limit. The CPU saw a peak temperature of just 84 degrees which is well below the 105 degree TJ Maxx. Now for a look at the Cinebench multi-core performance, and here we see that the 265K is good for just shy of 2,200 points, making it 8% faster than the 14700K and 18% faster than the 9900X. So we're looking more at 7950X and 14900K levels of performance in this test. The single core performance is also very strong with the P cores capable of 145 points and that's a 4% increase from the 9900X and 14% faster than the 14700K. Now, when it comes to power consumption, the 265K consumes 218 watts, which is around the same power draw we saw from the 12900K, 14600K, 7950X and 9950X. As we just saw, performance was comparable to the 7950X, so power efficiency is roughly on par with that part in this particular workload. It was also 8% faster than the 14700K, and yet here we see power consumption has been reduced by almost 100 watts, and that's an impressive 29% saving. All of that said, the more efficient Ryzen parts, such as the 7950X 3D, did deliver a similar level of performance to that of the 265K, while consuming 33% less power. Moving on to file compression performance, we see that the 265K is actually slightly slower than the 14700K, trailing by a 6% margin when using the same DDR5-7200 memory. Performance was also comparable to the 9900X. The 265K falls even further behind the 14700K when it comes to decompression performance, and this is due to a lack of SMT support. 
this time using the same memory, it's 15% slower and 18% slower than the 9900X, so that's a fairly disappointing result. The Blender Open Data Test has more positive results for the 265K, as here it is 7% faster than the 14700K and 8% faster than the 9900X, basically delivering 14900K light performance, so I think given the power savings that's pretty good. Now looking at the Krona 10 benchmark data, we find 14900K and 9900X light performance, making the 265K 10% faster than the 14700K. Now we have the Photoshop 2025 data, and here the new Arrow Lake CPUs are pretty underwhelming. And I'm still looking into these results, as these new CPUs should be faster in this workload, but as it stands for our configuration, the 265K is only able to match the Core i5 12600K, so that's very bad. But as I said, we'll continue to look into this one and hopefully be able to update our data soon. The Premiere Pro performance is much better, but ultimately still underwhelming, given that the 265K is slower than the 14700K and therefore the 9900X. Okay, time for the gaming benchmarks, and we'll start with Star Wars Jedi Survivor, where the 265K is pretty crap, if I'm being honest, coming in behind all competing parts. Using the same DDR5 7200 memory, it was 10% slower than the 14700K, 9% slower than the 9700X, and even 6% slower than the 9900X, which isn't exactly known to be a great gaming CPU. Of course, if you are after elite levels of gaming performance, you'd be more interested in the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D, and in that comparison, the 265K is almost 30% slower. Next up, we have The Last of Us Part 1, and here the 265K does quite well, slightly beating the 14900K and therefore 14700K. Granted, that's still not amazing for a next generation product, but it is worlds better than what we saw in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. It also means that the 265K is 12% faster than the 9900X in this example. The Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty results were really bad in our 285K review, and we suspected this could be a scheduling issue, so we disabled the e-cores within the BIOS, but that didn't seem to improve things. Yet, despite that, performance does improve when enabling the prioritized p cores setting under the hybrid CPU utilization option, boosting performance by around 15%. So, with the 265K manually configured for best performance here, we saw an average of 148 FPS using DDR5 7200. And this means when using the same memory, it is still 10% slower than the 14700K. Granted, that is a lot better than what we were seeing previously, but sadly, that is still massively disappointing. Performance in Hogwarts Legacy is very mid-tier, and that is to say that the 265K is more comparable with the 9600X and 14600K than it is the 9700X, and of course the 7800X 3D is just well out of reach. The 265K also fails to impress in ACC, coming in slower than the 12900K, while only just managing to beat the old 12700K, and as a result it was 8% slower than the 14700K and a massive 15% slower than the 9900X, or 22% slower than the 9700X, and 39% slower than the 7800X 3D. Next up we have Remnant 2, and here the 265K is providing 14700K light performance, making it slightly faster than the 9900X, but 7% slower than the 9700X and 15% slower than the 7800X 3D. Now I've updated our Homeworld 3 data from our 285K review. Changing the power plan from balance to high performance does help a lot in this example. And while we don't normally change these sort of settings for our testing, we've made an exception here as we're confident Intel and Microsoft will address this issue pretty quickly. Still, even with the power profile manually adjusted, the Arrow Lake CPUs are very underwhelming. The 265K, for example, is 3% slower than the 14700K and 8% slower than the 9900X. Sadly, we've been unable to work out or solve the horrible Arrow Lake performance in a Plague Tale Requiem. Intel is actively looking into this, so hopefully we'll get some sort of update in the near future. But as it stands, the 265K is very poor in this title, as was the 285K, and this sees it trail the 14900K by an 18% margin. The Counter-Strike 2 performance is also very weak, and I haven't found a solution to the poor performance for this title either. The 265K is slower than even the 14600K, 
which meant it was 13% slower than the 14700K when using the same DDR5-7200 memory. Starfield was a more positive title for the 285K, and we find the same thing with the 265K, though despite that it was unable to beat the outgoing 14700K. Still, when compared to the Zen 5 parts, Intel at least got a solid win here. The Space Marine 2 results are also highly disappointing. The 265K was slower than the 14700K by a 5% margin, and that meant it was slower than all competing AMD parts. The Hitman 3 performance looks good relative to the 9700X and 9900X, but despite that it is still 5% slower than the 14700K, so a disappointing result overall. And the Watch Dogs Legion performance, well, unfortunately it sucks. And although the 265K may have been able to match the 9900X, it was much slower than the 9700X and 14700K, trailing the latter by a 14% margin. And finally, we have Star Wars Outlaws, and with it comes more disappointing data. The 265K trailed the 14700K by a 6% margin in this example, though it was faster than both the 9700X and 9900X. Now, when it comes to power consumption when gaming, we see that the 265K is comparable to the 9900X based on this Cyberpunk data. The only issue being the 265K didn't perform that well in this game, especially in the section that we use for benchmarking. Therefore, The Last of Us Part 1 is a better game to look at power efficiency for these Arrow Lake CPUs, and here the 265K consumed 5% less power than the 9900X for 12% more performance. So that's a great result. That said, it's not the best result, as it also consumed 45% more power than the 7950X 3D, while delivering slightly less FPS performance. So here's the 14 game average data, and as you'd have probably guessed by now, the Core Ultra 7 265K doesn't stack up very well, coming in 8% slower than the 14700K, and 4% slower than the 9900X. And as I've said, the Ryzen 9 processor isn't a particularly good gaming CPU. It's also wild to consider that just a few months ago, you could purchase the 7800X 3D for just $340 US. And in fact, let's take a look at the cost per frame data now based on current retail pricing. So even after finding ways to boost performance in Homeworld 3 and Cyberpunk 2077, Arrow Lake still sucks really bad for gaming, so that's fun. When it comes to value, the 265K does stack up far better than the 285K did, thanks to the fact that it costs almost 40% less while being just 5% slower across the 14 games we tested. This means it's actually quite similar to the 9900X in terms of value, slightly better even. But as I've said a few times now, if you primarily care about gaming performance, the 9900X isn't the best choice from AMD. In fact, there's a number of far better options to pick from. The 7800X 3D, for example, at its inflated $480 US asking price is still 4% better value than the 265K and generally provides far superior gaming performance. But what really does the 265K in in terms of value is the Ryzen 7 7700X, which can currently be had for just $275 US, making it 35% better value. Of course, the 265K also fails to improve upon the value of existing 14th gen models, such as the 14700K, which is nearly 20% better value. And then we have the 14600K, which is not only a faster product overall, but it's also 35% better value. So in short, the 265K sucks. Following on from our 285K review, things don't look too different for the 265K review. Those Homeworld 3 and Cyberpunk numbers do look better now but that essentially does nothing to improving the gaming performance as a whole. Overall gaming performance is still very weak and sadly extremely underwhelming. If you were to cherry pick your games list or test certain games like Cyberpunk and a Playtale Requiem under lighter CPU loads, it'd probably be possible to produce results that allow Arrow Lake to match Raptor Lake, delivering the parody data that Intel promised us. But as I found in my 285K review, if you place these Arrow Lake CPUs under heavy load in games, for whatever reason they tend to fall in a heap, and that's exactly what we saw in A Plague Tale Requiem. Whether or not this is something Intel can address remains to be seen, but I sure hope it is, otherwise Arrow Lake is going to be an epic fail. So far the greatest improvement for Arrow Lake can be seen when monitoring power usage, and this was always expected to be the case, we just hoped that gaming performance would be much better than it is.
The 265K is more efficient than the 285K and does reach a point where it's very similar to the 12 and 16 core Ryzen models, at least the ones without 3D V cache like the 7950X 3D. For what will likely be around $400 US though, the 265K is essentially dead on arrival. Even if Intel manages to fix the gaming performance and genuinely finding parity with the 14700K, at that point, you'd only be looking at 7700X like gaming performance for a 45% price premium. Of course, the productivity performance of the 265K is much better, but if you're after a good balance of gaming and productivity performance, the 7950X 3D is a much better choice at $480 US. And of course, we have the Zen 5 based X 3D chips just around the corner, so parts like the 265K and 285K are facing some serious competition. As I said when wrapping up my 285k review, I fully expect Intel to iron out the kinks in the coming weeks, which it should help a bit, but I can't imagine it's going to be enough to save Arrow Lake. But I really hope I'm wrong about that. For now though, I am done with this initial review of the 265k. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. We we'll also have the join button if you want to become a Hardware Unbox member or Patreon. You get access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams, behind the scenes content and Q&A stuff. So, Check that out if you're interested. If not, perfectly fine. And of course, I would like to thank you for watching this review. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.